But tonight we're going to be doing a teaching and I, I titled tonight's message and the image of fear and it, we're continuing on with the types of the Antichrist. Last week we covered um, two of the types and we had finished before really I got to Nebuchadnezzar. There's a lot of different types of the Antichrist to be perfectly honest with you. The Bible is full of them. We're not going to sit here and try to exhaust all of that. I was just trying to really make some points to show you that there's connections from the Old Testament that go back to the book of Revelation that show us and prepare us. And, and kind of solidify for us probably what's going to be happening in the end times because there's things that have taken place in the past and the word of God says even in the Song of Solomon there's nothing new under the sun what's already what's going to take place has already happened before and the truth of the matter is is that I believe that to be the truth when it comes to prophecy and end time events that many of the things that are going to take place during the time frame of the great tribulation more specifically during the time frame when the wrath of God begins to hit that uh, some of these things have already happened, amen, and they take place throughout, and that's going to happen on a scale like never before, and people are going to suffer persecution like never before, but nevertheless, I just want to, to make that point, so we're not going to try to exhaust it, but tonight, one of the first things that we're going to talk about has to do with Nebuchadnezzar's image, okay, and specifically how it connects, I believe, so in such similarity to the image of the bees, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that, so... In, in Daniel chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, we can actually turn there in Daniel chapter 2, and we can take a look at uh, what, what ends up taking place in this passage of Scripture. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, if you'll remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon during that time frame, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were the young Hebrew boys. Y'all remember the story? And I've told it many a times, and so you probably do remember, but I just to try to refresh your memory... You know, I tried to explain it like this. I looked it up one time. I Googled it. How many miles is it from Jerusalem to Babylon? And it's about the same exact distance as it is from Homa to San Antonio. So if you can imagine that here's the Hebrew boys and all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, comes and he raids if you will, Jerusalem, their hometown. They're just sitting there minding their own business, doing what every young boy does during that time frame and that culture. And the next thing you know, they're being hauled off from home to San Antonio. They have to walk that long journey, if you will. And so, but they took their stand, amen. And we're going to see a little bit about that in the midst of this story. They took their stand at the right opportunities. Daniel later on when he was, well, once when he was a young man, whenever they offered him the food and the the drink of the world and he refused it but then also later on as an old man whenever they put him in the lion's den and also the three Hebrew boys they took their stand amen and so we re we're reminded that there's a world system out there and Babylon is a perfect picture of the world wanting and desiring to persecute the people of God the children of Israel the nation of Israel that God created out of that man named Abraham and that throughout these wicked leaders if you will and these nations Babylon is one of the heads of the seven-headed beast that we talked about. Amen. Uh, it's, it's, it definitely represents one of those heads. And, um, and, it's, and so it's in conjunction with the kingdoms of the earth that pull themselves together and desire to bring destruction to God's people. And this has been going on for thousands of years. And so, but at this point in time, Daniel has been found to have gifts that no one else in the land has. And he can interpret dreams and he can interpret visions. And Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. And essentially, as you see this picture, and, and, and by the way, for the... Um for the people that uh, that are watching on video, just to let you know, we're gonna uh, we're gonna try to connect the PowerPoint slides and the, the notes from now on back into our website, which is www. A G N O E O dash Bible study dot com. And that way you would be able to see the, the pictures that we're going to have uh, so that you could when you're watching the video, if you wanted to pause it, you could go back and look at some of the some of the things that we that we had up here. But nevertheless, what what you see in this particular picture is the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. And, and the head was gold. The um, the the chest right here, the breast was silver. The upper thighs were brass. The, the legs of iron were, uh, were the legs. And then the feet were a partial mixture of clay and iron. All right. And so Daniel ends up 
they, they don't, no one can really interpret the dream. And so they get Daniel. And so in verse 25, it says that Arioch brought Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto thee, make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. See, they couldn't do it. The, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers could not give the answer to the king. Now, now one of the things that I want you to realize is, is that in typology or a foreshadowing fashion, Nebuchadnezzar represents, once again, the Antichrist in this story. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is a king that later repented in, in his life. Uh, he, he allowed himself to be exalted as a god, which the Antichrist will also do. But at, but at some point, he, he went mad. Many of us who've read the Bible know that. He, for seven years, he literally walked around on all fours chewing grass like a like bovine right and but but at the end of the seven years he came to his senses the the lord gave him his right mind back nevertheless in this period of time he serves as a type of the antichrist he wants to exalt himself so in this fashion he would literally be the type of the antichrist and i just noticed as i was reading this again today i underlined it that these soothsayers and these magicians to me are a type of the false prophet and we're going to read a little bit in, in revelation 13 and it's important for us to understand and that's one point i want to make tonight is that whenever this thing happens on the scene and hopefully we won't be here to see it, but we should expect that there's going to be the Antichrist is a world ruler. All right. He's a he's a politician of politicians, if you will. He's a world ruler. And at the same time, the false prophet is going to be a religious figure. And the two of them are going to be working in conjunction with one another. And as we're going to read in Revelation 13, there's also an image that is erected in the likeness of the beast and that people are to worship the beast. And they're also to worship the image that is erected towards the beast. And so. Anyway, in this story, it says in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days, thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This, and, and the word terrible literally means to make afraid. It means to cause one to tremble. And it has the idea of being a very dreadful thing. So whenever Nebuchadnezzar saw this in this dream or this, however this went, whenever he had this dream, this vision in this dream, it caused fear. It struck fear in his heart and it caused dread in him and it caused him to tremble. It says the image, his head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest still that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Now, I like that. You know, the word of God says that, that they stumbled over the stone. Amen. That the, that the builders rejected the cornerstone. Amen. Jesus is the cornerstone. And what this is, a, it says right here, it says that he, it was a stone that was cut out without hands. In other words, man's hands didn't touch this stone. Amen. This is representative of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the rock, the stone that the builders rejected in the New Testament. Testament, Jesus said that this was the stone that the builders rejected and has become the corner. Back in those days, they didn't have a slab that they would pour as a foundation. They would lay a cornerstone and connected to those cornerstones, they would lay other mini stones. And upon those stones, they would erect the building that they were making. The point is, is that Jesus is the cornerstone and he's the stone that destroyed this image in the midst of this dream. Amen. And crushed it all to powder. And what you got to understand is, is that 
that these five kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Grecians, the, the Romans, we've already discussed all of that. But, in a, but and this is another form of, of the feet with the clay and the iron mix of the ten kingdom federation of the ten horns. You remember the ten horns? Ten toes, ten horns that will come together at the end. It's going to be the seventh kingdom because there's two before this. There's Assyria and Egypt before this. And in the seventh kingdom is that ten-horned, ten-king federation out of Revelation. Y'all heard me talk about that before. Ten toes, ten horns. Okay, is the point I'm making. But the stone that was made without hands crushes it and destroys it. And that stone is talking about Jesus. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken, verse 35, to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Amen. Jesus is going to be like a, a, a great mountain and his presence is going to fill the whole earth during the millennial reign of Christ. And then it says in verse 36, this is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and that hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So Daniel, you know, we're not going to go into the, to the rest of the dream. But the point is, is that Daniel has a dream. He's disturbed by the dream. Amen. And he, none of the soothsayers, none of the false prophets in the land can give him the interpretation of what the dream is. Daniel gives him the interpretation and says, you, O king, are a king of kings. He didn't say you're the king of kings. He said you're a king of kings. And he said you're the head of gold. Now, you would think that because of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar, it says that, Daniel said that it was, it was terrible. <laughs> when you had the dream, it was terrible. You, you were filled with dread. You began to tremble. You had fear on the inside of your heart. Amen? But nevertheless, in the next chapter, chapter 3, the next thing you know, what ends up happening is, is that Nebuchadnezzar decides he is going to erect a statue or an image to him, to his own self. And so what we see in this passage of scripture is, and, and this is just a picture that, that has, uh, it's, a, it's a likeness, it was an all gold image. And you see the people bowing down to it. And the only people that aren't bowing down to it are the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But one of the things that was interesting to me is, is that in Daniel chapter 3, it says right there in the first couple of verses, the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. Now, one score equals the number 20. So if you have 20 three times, you have 60. So it was 60 feet high, and then it was six feet wide. And then the other interesting thing to me is this, is that if you count the number of instruments, it says he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, one, flute, two, harp, three, sackbut, four, psaltery, five, and dulcimer, six. So within this image, I just find it interesting, it's 60 feet high, plus 6 feet wide, 66, plus there's six uh, instruments that are connected to it and whenever these instruments are so 666 is the number that we have there and and so uh, connected to whenever the music is played everyone is to fall down and they're to begin to worship and he says right here verse 6 and whosoever falleth not down and worships shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace 
And so one of the things that I want you to see, and we're not really getting into it quite yet, but I want you to already get a little taste of the fear that's going on here. The fact of the matter is, is that an image has been erected and there's not really any negotiating going on here. You're either going to fall down and worship the image or else you're going into the fiery furnace. Now, the reason that I made this particular slide right here, it had to do with Revelation chapter 13. We can actually turn there. We'll go ahead and turn there and read some of it. I know we read some the other day, but just to kind of familiarize ourselves with it. In Revelation 13, we have all of these elements. We have the beast, which once again is the Antichrist. Amen. We have the false prophet mentioned. We have the image of the beast, which I'm trying to explain to you in my mind. It perfectly is represented or typified as the image that Nebuchadnezzar had made in the book of Daniel. And we also have the number of the beast, which we know is 666. And uh, it goes on to say in here that, um, let's start at verse 4. It says, they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That comes out to 3.5 years if you do the math on that. It says, um, in verse 6, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle in them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, you know, I, I just want to point out something to you that whenever I first began to restudy the book of Revelation, I noticed this a lot. A lot of people, whenever they teach a pre-tribulation rapture, they make the point that once the first three chapters of the book of Revelation are finished, you, and, John, and, and John is called up hither to receive the vision. You no longer hear the church spoken of. But one of the things that I did notice, and I'm just pointing this out to you right now, is that the word saints is used multiple times. Okay? And so I just want to give you a heads up because as we go through, we're going to run into this more. And it's actually in the Daniel passage. And, and interestingly, we, we know that, yes, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the New Testament is written in Greek. Nevertheless, what I want you to know is, is that when you define these words that are used, like in the Old Testament in Daniel, the word saint is used. And in the New Testament right here in Revelation, the word saint is used. In both cases, it's describing a people that are holy and a people that are separated. So in both cases, it would be describing God's people. The saints are God's people. So pure pre-tribulation teachers are going to tell you that this word saints right here, it automatically means Old Testament, not say Old Testament, that wouldn't be a right way to say it. It describes Israelites, okay? Or it could also describe post-tribulation saints, like in other words, those that would have been left behind, okay? And so the word literally, once again, is, is hagios in the Greek, and it means to be separated out, it means to be made holy. It's definitely talking about the people of God and not trying to make a big, uh, big argument either way, one or the other, on whether or not it should, you know, I'm just letting you know that true, pure pre-tribulation teachers are going to tell you that that is specifically speaking of Israelites. Because once again, remember that seven year tribulation period does have something specifically to do with the nation of Israel. Remember, based upon the Daniel pro prophecy of the 70 weeks. And we have that one week that's left out there that has not been fulfilled. And whenever the prophecy was first given to Daniel, it said in the prophecy that these 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Amen? Does that make sense? All right. We're going to dig into a little bit more about time frames and some different possibilities, but I just wanted to point that out since that word saint was there. I don't know if that kind of stuff hits you when you're reading it, but that's what hits me. Why does it keep saying saints there? And so I'm just trying to, I'm trying to give you some, some reasons why that terminology would be used, okay? It says in verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So it's continuously used that way. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. This is talking about the false prophet. He had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, and they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Same scenario, right? In the book of Daniel, we have a type of the Antichrist, Nebuchadnezzar. He lifts himself up. He makes a golden image, 60 feet tall, 60 feet wide, six instruments. Whenever you hear the music, you must bow down and you must worship the, the image that is standing before you or you will be thrown into a fiery furnace. In the book of Revelation, there's a false prophet that rises up out of the sea. He's got two horns like a lamb. He's given a mouth like a dragon. He begins to speak. He causes fire to fall down from heaven. He causes miracles to take place. He's operating in a demonic anointing. And, he call, and, and the, because of the power and the deception that's taking place, he tells people you must worship the beast, which is the Antichrist, the world ruler. And now an image is erected and it's given power for the image to also speak. Some people, we don't know how that would happen. It, it, it would, nevertheless, I mean, they caused the rod, demonic anointing caused a rod to turn into a serpent in Pharaoh's day, but some people have questioned whether it could be a hologram. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, this thing is going to speak and it's going to have animation, it says in the word of God, and you're going to have to worship it. And if you don't, just like Nebuchadnezzar told the people of his province that they would, that the people here are going to also die. It says in verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I mean, how, how long? I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, it's something to think about. We, we got to think. I mean, I don't think that the church is going to be here at this time. I'll be perfectly honest with you. But you got to think. How, how, how long you reckon you could go without any food in your belly? You know, before you start having a little bit of fear grip your heart, how thirsty does one have to be before fear starts to grip their heart, before they become a little bit delirious? Because I'm just going to be honest with you. Let's just say for a second that, that, we're, that we don't even have to talk about the whole tribulation thing. Let's just act like America's not the same tomorrow when we wake up. And say that's what keeps bothering me. It's not so much that I feel like I have to preach something other than a pre-tribulation rapture. That's not the issue. I'm believing in the blessed hope. Come back and get us, Lord. Amen? Amen. What my concern is, is that we seem to think that America can't be touched. And if the things that are going on across the world and the things that are happening in the nation that we're seeing happen in the nation are taking place and things begin to hit us in such a way that we weren't expecting, economies collapsing in Greece, uh, the Chinese dollar, whatever they call it, the yang falling and their stock market crashing and, and other things taking place around the world that are causing people to really take notice and some different, you know, levels of chaos. If things happen, how long do you reckon a person could go without food or water? And, and, and this is just one thing that I'm trying to say. This is a fear tactic. Most of what I'm trying to talk to you about tonight surrounds fear. Not that I'm trying to make you fearful, but like I'm trying to make you aware that fear is powerful. Fear is powerful. It grips people's hearts and it begins to cause them to be driven in a direction that they don't even realize that they're going. How 
the time until they're already there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then he goes on to say right here, and that no man might buy or sell, say, verse 17, that he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score 6. So 666. Six, six. I, I emphasize the word false prophet right there. I wasn't really planning on doing this, but I don't know that I'm going to do a lot of teaching on the false prophet, but I wanted to go ahead and just mention something. So, you know, I wanted to try to, to, try to let you help envision what some, a scenario like this may look like. I'm not saying that this is what it's going to be. I'm just trying to give you an example based on something that's already happened. And I'm going to share with you what I, what I personally think. You may think I'm crazy. Some of you on video, once I say this, and even some of you in this room, you might think I'm crazy. We, we might have less people here next week after I tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm going to tell you. The, first of all, the beast is going to be a world ruler. So I got a picture of Adolf Hitler that I just hit on my screen right here. Because Adolf Hitler, we know, was a world ruler. And I talked to you about it last week. Talked about the demonic anointing that was behind him when he began to speak and how the crowds were mesmerized and how people just began to follow along with him. Well, so what we were reading in Revelation 13 had to do with that was all mentioned in here was the beast and a false prophet. And so I'm not trying to tell you that this, I just threw up another picture of a guy named Pope Pius XII. And I'm not trying to tell you that this is the exact scenario, but I am trying to tell you that this was a scenario that literally happened in the 1940s. And the scenario that happened is, now I just put up another picture of Hitler and Pope Pius XII in the same room face to face, with one another, and now I'm going to throw up another picture of Pope Pius XII signing something called the Reichs Concordant. I think I know how to spell this. It was spelled Reichs Concordant. And what it was, was it was an agreement. It was an agreement between what they call the Holy See, which is the Vatican or the Pope, and Hitler. And the Vatican endorsed him. The Pope endorsed Hitler so that the people would also endorse him. And through it, you can go do your own research. It's, really, it's everywhere. You just, we don't ever hear about it. Uh, and through it, basically, Hitler and the Vatican were, if you will, they were together. I mean, you can, you can call it what you want. No, you would never see them other than in this particular picture right here all the time standing with one another. But nevertheless, if you sign an agreement with someone, that means that you're with them. But it wasn't only this. The next picture shows Mussolini, which was the fascist leader of Italy, coming out. And this is called the Lateran Treaty. It was signed in Rome, uh, signed between Rome and Mussolini. And essentially in this Lateran Treaty, what happened was is that it recognized the Vatican as an independent state. So Mussolini, the leader of Italy at the time, recognized the Vatican as an independent state with the Prime Minister Mussolini agreeing to give the church financial support in return for public support from the Pope dur during that time. And so what I want you to see is, is that this is a perfect picture, in my opinion, of how you can have a world leader who is bent upon... See, because Mussolini and Hitler were actually together, and we know that there's going to be other kings or kingdoms that are going to throw in their lot. The Ten Kingdom Federation is going to throw in their lot with the Antichrist, who will be the world leader, and that there will be a false prophet connected to him. I almost started to get into Jesuitism, and I, and I just knew that I wouldn't have the time, so maybe some other time that we'll do that. Because one of the interesting things is, and I'm not trying to say that the present pope is going to be the false prophet, although Personally, if you had to, if you had to call me to the carpet on it, I would tell you that's what I believe is going to happen. And, and and the present pope is the first Jesuit priest that's ever been a pope. And if you don't know anything about Jesuitism, then you need to start doing some research. And you know what? If you hang around long enough, I'm going to I'm going to teach you some things about it because I think that it's relevant to what we're going through. Things are hidden 
and people don't really know what's going on and nobody really knows the true history of what went on behind the scenes. All we seem to know is what we've been told. And so I just kind of wanted to give you an idea. Does that make a little bit sense? You got a world ruler, you got a religious ruler, a false prophet, and then also we see this image of the beast, and then also we were told about the mark of the beast. Lawlessness. So basically in, in, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, actually we can turn there real quick. Daniel 7, verse 25, talks about the Antichrist. It says, and he shall speak, Daniel 7, 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High. Talking about the Antichrist speaking against God. Well, let's go back up to verse 24 because it's just consistent with what we're talking about. It says, the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, I, I'm just going to ask you to take my word for it. I can prove it to you through the scriptures. But the word time actually means one year equals one year times equals two years and half a time or divided time equals a half a year so you got three and a half once again we're staying consistent with three and a half years there's multiple scriptures that that back this up by the way i'm just letting you know there's scriptures in the book of revelation time one year times two years half a time half a year so three and a half years is the time frame really of the last part of the great tribulation whenever the antichrist will reveal himself and the wrath of god at this point in time is being poured out upon the earth like like never before but what i wanted you to see here is is what it says in the passage it says that he shall wear out the saints verse 25 of the most high and think to change times now that word describes seasons. He's bringing in a whole new season. He's bringing in a whole new change. You, you, you got to understand that the spirit of Antichrist, and we've talked about that before, right? One of the first teachings that we did when we first started on the Antichrist was we described the fact that the word of God is real clear, that there's been many Antichrists, but there's also the spirit of Antichrist. Satan is also a spirit. There's a spirit that's moving and operating upon the face of the earth. And it's been driving humanity in a certain direction. Like we talked about last week, one of the types of the Antichrist was Nimrod. He's one of the clearest picture, if not the clearest picture, of the Antichrist that we will ever see because of the fact that they're all desiring. He desires to bring all of humanity together under a one world, one rule order, under one government, one religion, one financial institution. And in a similar fashion, that's exactly what the Antichrist will do through the power of Satan. But it, so he's going to change times. Everything's he, he's bringing in his own reign, if you will. For his short period of time. And not, not only that, but he's going to change laws. And I just wanted to, I used these two examples down here at the bottom. I put on the slide lawlessness because I wanted to just use the, 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 this concept and tell you that that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. In chapter 3, whenever he erected this image, he made a change to the law. That law wasn't there before. You understand that? And, and what he did was he made a new change to the law. And what he said was... If you don't bow down and worship this image, whenever the music begins to play, you're going to be cast into a fiery furnace. And we see even in the days that we live in, laws are changing like this. Are they not? Amen. I'm telling you right now, I'm not trying to say that the time frame is actually here. Some people would tell you we're already in the tribulation. What I'm trying to say is this. It's already happening. The spirit of Antichrist is already moving upon the face of the earth. And he's causing laws, at least the laws that we know and see, to be changed rapidly before our very eyes. Also, in, 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 the, in the, uh, the, the passage of Darius. I, actually, I'd like to read that one. Well, I, put, I think I'll put the scripture up there. In Darius, uh, in chapter 6, this is after the Persians took over Babylon. 
And the princes of the land wanted to come against Daniel because they were jealous of him and envious of him. You remember the story? They had new laws written. They talked to King Darius into writing new laws. And they said that no man is to come over the next however many days to, and, and bring a petition between any other God before any other God or you. And anybody that does, let it be cast into the lion's den. And once a Persian king wrote something, they weren't allowed to take it away. And so he changed laws. Darius changed laws. And, you know, and, and, we'll, and we'll look at that a little bit more. But the, the, this, is, this is the scripture that we just read. He shall speak great words against the Most High, the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand. It also goes on to say right here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. Well, what does that mean? The mystery of iniquity. Mystery. Mysterion in the Greek. Iniquity is an interesting word because it's literally a nomia. And this word A in the Greek, I've told you this before, it means without. Or, well, yes, without. So whenever you see A, whatever this word means, it means that you don't have it anymore. Does that make sense? You put the A prefix in front of it and it knows it. Well, this word nomia actually means law. So it means without law. The mystery of lawlessness already works. The spirit of Antichrist is already working in the land and the mystery of lawlessness is already at work in the midst of the land. But yet, the, the, but what this scripture is talking about is talking about the Antichrist and we'll probably get into this whole passage in 2 Thessalonians next week to really break it down. But what I want you to know is, is that what it's saying here is that he will not be able to be revealed. I'm telling you right now, I believe that we're going to do a teaching on occult exposure. And I hope to be able to help open up your eyes and let you see some things that are going on in the world that I think that we've been blinded to for a long time. But it doesn't matter what their plans are. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because I'm here to tell you that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he is the one that is in control. And what the Word of God is saying right here is this. Is that the spirit, the mystery of lawlessness, it's already at work, only he who now lets. Now, the way that that is translated, it's difficult for us to understand, but it's talking about the restrainer. He who now holds down is how it could be translated. He who now suppresses. And it goes on to say this, that he will continue to suppress until he be taken out of the way. That right now the Holy Spirit is suppressing the plans of evil. <laughs> now I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is going to be taken completely off the earth. But the point is, is that right now the Holy Spirit is suppressing and he's holding down the plans of Antichrist and his ability to reveal himself. We'll get into it next week more than likely, but the truth is, is that the same word that's used for the book of Revelation is also used for the Antichrist, and there will be a revelation of him. He will be the one that's actually revealed first, and people will think that he's the real one because of all of the miracles and all of the signs and the power and the voice of the dragon and the demon spirits like frogs and all the false prophet and everything that's going on. People are going to be hungry, man. I'm telling you, I'm going to show you something in a minute. I believe people are calling for it. Just a little bit of chaos that we're seeing on other parts of the world. People don't even realize it, but they're being influenced to call upon a leader or ruler to come and help us, save us. Oh Lord, let somebody touch your American life and see how fast people start crying out for somebody to save them and to help them. And that's what I want to talk to you about, fear. It says right here in this passage in Daniel chapter 3 verse 7, it says that whenever you hear the sound of these instruments, it says that when you hear all kinds of the sounds of the music, it says what happened was, was that when they heard it, all the people, the nations and the languages, they fell down and they worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, I did, the word fear is not in the text, but I have to tell you that that's what is driving what is taking place. 
You don't think for one second that somebody's going to stand up and say, no, I don't want, well, thank God three people did. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, is that the majority of the crowd is mesmerized and hypnotized by a spirit of fear that has already told them, look, this is the rules. This is the law that has been written. This is the decree of the king. Whenever you hear the music of the six instruments begin to play, you bow down and you worship this image. And if you don't, you get thrown into the fire furnace. And so what we're told is, is that when the music played, the people bowed. But then it goes on to say in, in, in this book of in Revelation 13, 15, we don't have to turn there. I'll just read it off the slide. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. But you see, the word of God says that in 2 Timothy 1, 7, that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and turn to that scripture. I was just reviewing that earlier today and I thought it was a really good scripture and I just wanted to kind of talk about it because it just happened. The Lord put that scripture in my, in my spirit and as I began to read a little bit further, I realized, you know what? This is beautiful because while the context at first doesn't seem to apply, it does. Amen. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven. It says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Let's go back a little bit. Let's start at verse, uh, verse 3. Paul is writing to young Timothy, who's a pastor. He says, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. It's so important for us to raise our children up in the ways of God. Amen? Amen. Ultimately, they're going to have to make a choice on who they're going to serve. But praise God, we need to make sure that they understand the things of God. It says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now at first you may question... How does the spirit of fear connect to Paul trying to talk to Timothy about being a pastor and about his faith, amen, and about living for God? Because, see, the problem is, is that you and I would automatically connect ourselves into the story because that's what we do. We remember where we live and we think, well, I don't have too much of a spirit of fear just living for Jesus. But what you got to understand is that when Paul writes this book, this letter to Timothy, he's in a prison. He's not just in any prison, but he's in what's known as the Mamertine prison. And it's a pit. You can still go see it if you go to Rome. It's a pit that's dug out. And he tells to young Timothy, he says, when you make it this way, bring the cloak. Because it's cold. Amen. Bring the, bring the scrolls. Because I still need to read the word of God. He knows that his time is coming up. He's already received his death sentence from Nero. He's about to get his head put on a chopping block. But what he's doing is he's encouraging young Timothy not to forget the faith and the, and, and the calling that was stirred up in him for the gospel. He goes on to say in verse 8, Be thou not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. See, now it gets a little bit more detailed, right? So the, the Lord hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. See, if you're a young pastor named Timothy, and your mentor, or whatever you want to call him, you're, you're the man that educated you in the ways of God, now sits in a prison with a death sentence on his head, and he's about to get his head chopped off, now fear may start to try to grip your heart a little bit, if that makes sense. And he goes on to say, verse 9, who has saved us and called us, with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Look at this. This is what I want you to see. Who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Hallelujah. Jesus has abolished death. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that fear 
in these stories that we're talking about, both in the time frame of Daniel, fear is gripping their hearts, causing them to bow before the image, even in the time in the future of the book of Revelation, causing people to bow down and to worship something that I know that they didn't really want to worship, but fear has gripped their heart but they, because of death. The fear of death. But yet the Apostle Paul said that Jesus has come and he's abolished death for the believer. Hallelujah. And he's given us revelation of immortality through the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I need to hold on to that no matter what we go through. No matter. Hallelujah. No matter what trial and tribulation we face. We need to remember that our King of Kings and Lord of Lords has abolished death. And he's revealed immortality to us. Listen, you don't want to give up your, your eternal soul for a temporary moment because of fear. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. You go, now, listen, not only is there fear in these stories, but there's power in these stories. Amen. Like, for instance, this is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace... And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image that you have set up. Hallelujah. So we see all these people bowing. I had a picture of it up there. And there was three Hebrew boys that weren't bowing. Three of them refused to bow down. Even though the whole crowd is being mesmerized and hypnotized to move in a certain direction, these young Hebrew boys, they're like, I'm not bowing down to that. Amen. Amen. One, of, one of the things I wanted to, wanted to share with you, too, is, is that I wanted you to see this, this video. I, I'm not trying to say that she's definitely calling for a new world order. That's not what I'm trying to say. I don't think that she really realizes what she's saying. But what I'm trying to tell you is, I'm trying to set this up for you to see with the little bit of chaos that Greta Van Susteren sees going on in the world, what's already coming out of her mouth, you just imagine for one second if that stuff started hitting the land that she lived on and how people would start responding. For a minute. In World War II, six million Jews, because of their faith, were exterminated by Adolf Hitler. The cruelty was breathtaking. And it was only after six million were executed in ovens and worse, that many nations finally stepped in to take down Hitler. But why did it take so long for the world finally stopped Hitler? Many said they did not know Hitler had these extermination camps. They had no idea. Yes, of course, there is no internet, no Twitter, no Facebook, no cable news. It's a very different time. Which brings me to now and to ISIS and Christians. We have proof, video proof. We have no excuses. ISIS is killing tens of thousands, including Christians, only because of their faith. So our generation, my generation, can either bury its head in the sand while the brutal beheadings continue, or we can stop it. And just as with the fight to stop Hitler, one nation can't fight ISIS alone. We need all the great nations, and we need one leader to lead all those nations. And if President Obama can't do it for whatever reason, maybe Chancellor Angela Merkel or Prime, Mer Merkel or Prime Minister David Cameron, I don't care who takes the lead. I just know what's right. My generation just can't continue to look the other way. And that's my authority comment tonight. So the main thing that I wanted to see there was, do you, do, you see how, do you see how she was saying all these great nations need to come together and that we need one ruler or one leader uh, to, to be able to take the lead, to be able to move us in the right direction to do something about this. So I'm just letting you know, and this is something that I feel like the Lord put on my heart, and I'll try to get into it more when we do teach occult exposure. I feel like what the Lord has showed me is, is that in order for there to be a desire for this so-called peace prince to come, he's not the prince of peace, but that this counterfeit and uh, Christ to come, there's going to have to be a desire for people to want him to come. You understand? And it's almost like I believe that the enemy is going to try to produce 
chaos like is already taking place in order to come upon the scene and say, I'm going to bring peace. But then once he comes on the scene, then things are actually going to open up and even worsen. So I expect almost, this is just what I believe, and you don't have to believe it with me. I'm not asking you to do that. I almost believe that there's going to be almost like a pre-tribulation tribulation, if you will, that, that's going to cause chaos. I believe that's even happening now. I believe that the, that the scenes are being set on the world stage in order for the world and the inhabitants of the world to say, we need some help. And that that's whenever this antichrist is going to rise up. See, I think that all of our, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, or you can think about it in your own mind, what you were thinking. For the longest time, all I thought was is that we were going to live happy here in America until the rapture took place. And then we were going to go and, you know, because they talk about how the first three and a half years are peace. And then the last three and a half years is when it really gets bad. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is this, is that that may be the case. But what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing happening is, is that there's going to be a lack of peace that brings upon the liar who says he's going to bring peace and then he's going to sign that agreement with Israel and there's going to be a fake peace for three and a half years and then he's going to break it and then that's when the wrath of God's going to hit and so I'm just letting you know that I think that there's some things brewing and some things coming that I don't know that we were really ready for and so that's why I'm trying to prepare people and at least put it in people's heads. And if I'm wrong on all that, at least we're aware, you know, then it's just my fault. But if I'm right, at least we're aware that something was, was, was brewing. Amen? Mm -hmm. So it goes on to say that uh, now when Daniel knew, this is just another story of somebody having power. And this is whenever Darius wrote that new decree. Remember I was talking to you about how the Antichrist wants to change laws and seasons and how two different laws were written. And in this case, this was the one where Darius wrote it and said that, you know what, you, you can't worship any other God. Look what it says. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. This is Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. It says he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just as the three Hebrew boys didn't bow down in front of that image just because they were told to. And whenever this petition was signed by Darius, Daniel didn't change anything. He went into his house. He opened up his windows. He got down on his knees. He faced Jerusalem. And he prayed to God three times a day. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, the word of God says that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their own lives, even unto death. I want you to know that it's the blood of the lamb that gives us access to the presence of God. Amen. To receive the strength that we need. The word of God says in Romans chapter five, verses one through three, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God and we have access into this grace in where we stand. It's the blood of Jesus that justifies us. It's the sacrifice of Christ that makes us right. And it's because we're in Christ and we have access to grace that we can stand in the face of anything that the world or anything that the enemy may try to bring our way. Amen. And so it's the blood of the lamb and it's the word of our testimony and the fact that the believer did not even love their own lives even to the point of death. Real quick, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Goliath. And one of the things, because I believe he's also a type of Antichrist. You know, the Word of God said in the book of Daniel, and also said in the book of Revelation 13, who can make war with the beast? Once again, we're still talking about fear. Because in this story, what's happening is, is that this warrior appears to be so big, so powerful, and he strikes so much fear inside the people of God's heart that he seems insurmountable. It seems as though there's no way that anyone could come against him. The word of God says that he was six cubits in a span tall. It's also interesting that the head of his spear was six shekels in weight. And he also had six specific pieces of armor. So just like the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar erected had 666 built within it, also Goliath has the number of the beast built within him, 666, and he once again stands and he defies the armies of the living God. That's what the Word of God says. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 10. I'll just read it to you. We're moving along now. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel. This day give me a man that we may fight together. 
And so just as it said in Revelation 13, that he would, who's going to make war against this beast? Whenever you look at this giant, the way that he looks, who's going to make war against him? Word of God says in Revelation 13, 6, that he opened his mouth. Who's that? The Antichrist. And he blasphemed. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now, what's interesting is, is that the word defy in the Hebrew and the word blaspheme in the Greek mean the same exact thing. Amen. And it describes the tearing down, the defamation of God's character, speaking ill towards God. But they both mean the same exact thing. And so the Antichrist in the book of Revelation is defaming the name of God. And Goliath in the Old Testament is defaming the name of God. And once again, we have just as in the time frame of Daniel, fear being exerted upon the people and causing them to bow. And in this case, also, we have fear causing the people of God to cower because look at what the word of God says. First Samuel 17 11. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. But good news, hallelujah, because just as in the book of Daniel, there was that young, those three Hebrew boys. So in our story here, we have young David, amen, who was a type of Christ. Who is the one who destroyed this type of the Antichrist. You know what else is interesting? I don't think I'll put a slide in here about it. But Goliath dies of a head wound. And he also, the word of God says that the head wound, that the, that the beast dies of a mortal head wound from a sword. And David kills Goliath with a rock, Jesus, amen, and then cuts his head off with a sword. Hallelujah. And so there's definitely these, these types of connecting together. It says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is young David speaking. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I just love it. Amen. Everybody else might be cowering in the camp. Everybody else might be trembling in fear and afraid. Amen. But, but don't let anybody's heart fail them because of this. I'm going to go and fight him. And I don't know about you, but I hope and pray that the same grace that flooded David's heart and the same grace that flooded Daniel's heart and the same grace that flooded those three Hebrew boys' hearts would flood the people of God's hearts in the midst of times where there's chaos upon the land, that the grace of God will strengthen us, amen, and empower us in the midst of all of that. It says right here that... Um, in, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, and I'm closing, I'm getting close to closing right here. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and that you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, I have to tell you that for a pure pre-tribulation teacher, they would say, yeah, but that's not talking about... After the rapture, that's before the rapture. Well, this is my point. My point is, is that what if we do go up in a pre-tribulation rapture, but once again, America doesn't stay the same way that we always thought it would. See, I like the fact that I can tell y'all this, and I believe y'all are going to be back next week. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We need to be told the, the possibilities of things that can happen in the midst of this world that are going on. We don't need to be, oh, but you're not making me feel good, preacher. No, I don't make you feel real good whenever the Holy Spirit gives you a backbone and gives you strength, amen, to be like a Daniel, to be like the three Hebrew boys, to be like a David, and to stand strong in the midst of the trial. If, if there was tribulation like this, let's say that, that, that this doesn't have to do, like in other words, this is one of the churches of the, of the book of Revelation. And this is all pre-tribulate, great tribulation time frame. Yet nevertheless... It's saying that during the church age, there was tribulation. That the devil was going to cast some of them in prison. And that they were going to be tried. And that they were going to endure tribulation. But that they should be faithful even unto death. And that God would give them a crown. Amen. I don't know if you can see this picture or not. I love this picture. I, I put a picture up here for the people watching the video. You could Google it. Just All you have to do is Google one man in the Hitler crowd that does different than everybody else. This picture is a lot bigger. I mean, the crowd is, is enormous. And every single person is saluting Hitler except for this one guy right here in the middle. He refuses to do it. 
And he's watching what everybody else is doing, but he, for some reason, isn't hypnotized by the demonic anointing. And I just wanted to make the point, amen, that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Whenever we become born again Christians, the Holy Spirit takes residence on the inside of our heart. And I just know and believe that no matter what we may have to face, no matter what we may have to endure before the rapture of the church takes place, the Holy Spirit will give his true saints revelation. He will allow them to see, amen, what's going on. He will prepare our hearts and give us strength to endure, amen, until the end. Praise God. Hallelujah.